Hello once again and welcome to the next module here in our class together. Uh, what I want to do in this module is to continue our discussion of natural law theory. Uh, and what we're going to do specifically in this module is to uh, continue to branch off a little bit from our textbook and its introduction to the basics of Thomas's uh, natural law account uh, to include some uh, helpful principles and other topics uh, that uh, are part of current natural law uh, discussions and are important in terms of teaching natural law to other people and also in addressing uh, some of the controversial issues that come up uh, in connection with ethics and the faith today. Uh, so if you haven't finished reading the second section of the textbook yet, I would encourage you to do that uh, here, but we're not going to be addressing it uh, directly in the module. Although if you do have questions about your continued reading in that, of course you can always uh, post questions about that in Blackboard, uh, either in your group form or in the Ask the Professor uh, section on Blackboard. But what I want to start off with uh, today then in kind of adding some of the uh, meat to our framework of natural law from Aquinas uh, is to look at, again, a handful of other topics and not addressed directly in the text. Uh, and the first of those is the role of conscience in natural law theory. Uh, and this is, of course, very important. Uh, when you ask somebody uh, why is something right or wrong, uh, typically, or at least in many cases, you're going to get a response that includes conscience. Right? Well, look, uh, my conscience tells me that's wrong, or my conscience tells me this is okay even though other people say it's wrong. Uh, and a lot of people, especially uh, some Catholics, are going to say, well, you know, we have a moral obligation to follow our conscience, and my conscience tells me this is okay, so uh, even though this might be contrary to what the church is teaching, since my conscience says it's okay, well, then, then I can proceed with that. Uh, and this comes up uh, quite a bit when you get into discussions of, of Catholic ethics. Uh, and along those lines, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put up on Blackboard uh, for you uh, a brief article uh, by Cardinal Pell, uh, that appeared in First Things a few years ago, uh, which I think is a nice response uh, to some of those typical arguments you hear uh, based on, well, my conscience tells me this is okay. Uh, but uh, if you're not going to get a chance to look at that or uh, just to go ahead and explain it uh, for you here in the module, uh, it's important to understand how conscience does fit into uh, an understanding of natural law as the basis for what's right and wrong. And it certainly is true uh, that conscience is vitally important in a proper understanding of natural law. Uh, conscience is essentially our sense that we have uh, within us. It's innate. All human beings are, are born with it, uh, or at least all human beings ought to be born with it. Perhaps psychopaths lack it in some way, which might be an interesting discussion. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, uh, everyone is born with this innate sense of basic principles of right and wrong uh, that we call conscience. Uh, and this is again part of natural law theory, right? Natural law says that it's part of our nature uh, to act in certain ways. And, and part of that includes having a basic sense of what's right and wrong uh, to do as human beings. Uh, and this isn't based only on natural law theory or Aquinas um, or observation of people either. And we can certainly find precedent for this in Scripture itself, right? In Romans uh, 1 and 2, when Paul is talking about kind of the grand overview of history and how sin came into the world, uh, he talks about the fact that even the pagans um, have a sense of right and wrong. Uh, and in fact, some of them uh, will follow that sense and do what their conscience tells them is right, and that on the day of judgment, uh, that will be uh, something that can be uh, used in their defense. Now again, spelling out what exactly that means uh, is, is a topic for another class, for our Church in the New Testament class. But uh, I bring that up simply to note that it's in Scripture too, this idea that everybody has this innate sense of right and wrong. Um, now what's really important to note here, right, that this is different than society's general understanding of the conscience. Right, so for many people in society today, uh, your conscience is some sort of inner creative force, right? That, uh, well, my conscience looks at something and determines whether this serves right or wrong, uh, and it's somehow the conscience that makes up the decision or makes up the judgment. 
Uh, but that's not the natural law understanding of conscience, right? The natural law understanding is that our conscience is like uh, other senses that we have, right? That my eye doesn't determine what I see. Uh, my eye is a sense that allows me uh, to interpret, make sense of the light patterns that are out there in the world around me. Uh, and our conscience works in a similar way, right? That it is a, a faculty, a capacity that we have to uh, understand, perceive the natural law that is out there in the world. Um, so that it has an objective uh, reality out there in the world. This means uh, that our conscience is like other capacities in that it needs to be and should be developed and strengthened, uh, right? Just as we can, if you're a musician, train your ear uh, to discern the proper harmonies, to discern uh, the proper way a piece of music should unfold. Um, an artist can train their eye, right? That we can have a basic capacity, uh, but then in certain areas of our life, we can work to improve on it. We can uh, fine tune it and develop it. Uh, we can fine tune our palate when it comes to eating or drinking. Uh, and our conscience is similar. We're born with a basic sense of right or wrong, uh, but that we need to then to build on that and to form our conscience, right? This is the terminology we often use is forming the conscience. Uh, and we do that by, uh, by studying, by learning moral principles from our friends, from our family, from the church, uh, from reading, from our own life experiences. All these different things can go uh, together and contribute to a formation of our conscience. Uh, and we need to and ought to do that. Uh, of course, it also means, like other capacities, our conscience can be uh, deformed. It can be misguided and even uh, practically destroyed and uh, debilitated, right? That if you constantly violate your conscience, if you um, train it using bad examples, uh, that over time there can be a cumulative effect to where uh, you can't really even rightly perceive the right and wrong in a situation, right? So, uh, you know, if somebody, for example, listens to uh, blaring loud heavy metal music over and over and over again, uh, eventually not only will you not develop a finer appreciation of uh, harmony and, and musical technique, uh, you will in fact damage your capacity to hear and perceive those things. Uh, and the same thing can happen with our conscience. When we violate it over and over and over again, uh, we can really arrive at the point where our conscience becomes deadened or it becomes uh, distorted so that what we perceive as right in the situation, uh, and in fact from the perspective of a non-distorted conscience, would be clearly wrong. Uh, so it's important to know uh, that yes, we all have a conscience, uh, but our conscience can be wrong because it is a, a capacity to perceive or to sense. Uh, it's not what determines right or wrong uh, in and of itself. Now it is true, one of the things we will often hear when you talk about this is, well, we have a moral obligation to follow our conscience and my conscience is telling me this is okay. Well, again, one thing to point out is, uh, yes, your conscience can be wrong, uh, but yet yeah, it, it is true that you do have a moral obligation to follow your conscience, right? If you really believe something is right, uh, then you ought to do it. And if you really believe that something is wrong, uh, then you ought not to do that. Uh, and yes, uh, you do have a moral obligation to follow that. But it's, again, important to recognize that that judgment of our conscience can, in some cases, uh, be wrong. So there's a corresponding uh, obligation as well, that we have a responsibility to rightly uh, form our conscience. And if we misform our conscience uh, to where we perceive what's wrong as being right, um, in our choice of carrying out that action, uh, our culpability might be reduced, right? So uh, when I was making the particular choice to do this thing that I've trained myself to think is okay, my culpability in performing that action, my degree of responsibility is going to be reduced due to the fact that I don't really in that particular situation know that what I'm doing is wrong. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm off the hook. It doesn't mean I'm innocent. Um, stepping back from that particular action, I do have moral responsibility uh, for having misshapen my conscience. 
Uh, and again, this is similar to uh, the culpable ignorance that the textbook talked about. Uh, this would be similar to, say, for example, situations where uh, somebody uh, is intoxicated and does something uh, immoral. Uh, you know, uh, an, an intoxicated person who uh, crashes a car into somebody and injures or kills them, their culpability for that particular action, for, for crashing the car, uh, is going to be reduced based on the fact that they weren't really capable of uh, acting rightly in that situation. However, they are still culpable uh, for having made themselves intoxicated and putting themselves in a position to then drive. Uh, so there's still a larger responsibility for making sure that your conscience functions properly to the extent that you're able to. Um, and so that's an important thing to make sure that we can explain to people when they say, well, my conscience tells me this is okay, so it must be uh, all right. Uh, so again, uh, hopefully that's pretty clear at this point, having read uh, the textbook and thought about natural law a bit. Uh, but I would encourage you to, to go ahead and read that article by Cardinal Pell uh, and to make sure that you bring this up uh, if you talk about natural law with catechists or with students, uh, because this is one of the, the issues that will often be brought up as a response to natural law. So it's important to make sure people understand uh, what the conscience really is uh, and, and how it fits into a larger understanding of Catholic ethics. All right, so we're, we've covered conscience at this point, so let's go ahead and move on now. And now I want to turn on the next page to talk about another uh, component of natural law theory that is important and will come up quite often, and that's the principle of double effect. When we think about the issues that most often get debated uh, or brought up in classes or catechetical sessions about uh, Catholic ethics, uh, a lot of those situations involve uh, complex choices where uh, there's both a good and bad thing that's going to come out of this choice, right? So what about uh, women who are facing severe health crises while pregnant? Can they do uh, something that will uh, cause uh, an abortion or can they get an abortion? Or, uh, well, what about people who are in severe pain but to treat their pain uh, we basically have to speed up the end of their life or um, all these kinds of scenarios that get it brought up or at least uh, a great number of them are going to involve this uh, characteristic where there's a good and a bad uh, both that are going to follow from the action so how do we decide what to do in these situations right this isn't a nice straightforward thing where um, well look this guy wants to shoot this other guy because he doesn't like him well that one seems pretty straightforward. You shouldn't do that. Uh, but can he shoot the guy uh, in order to uh, bring about the end to a war that's killing thousands of other people, even though this guy isn't directly involved in it? This maybe gets a little more complicated, right? So this is where uh, the principle of double effect uh, comes into play. Uh, and the principle of double effect is uh, really kind of a, a framework. It's a guide. Uh, for reasoning through these sorts of complicated issues where you have multiple effects from a decision or an action. Now it's important to clarify at the outset that this is not uh, an equation, right? This isn't some sort of magic formula that we can take uh, and plug any situation into and it's going to spit out uh, the right answer for us. There's still going to need to be, uh, as you work through these steps, uh, a good bit of a critical judgment going on and trying to figure out how does this situation fit the framework? Uh, so it's not going to be, okay, well now we've got the principle of double effect, now we can have black and white decision uh, on every issue without really needing to do a whole lot of work. But what the principle of double effect can do uh, is to at least set up a framework, set up uh, a process to go through in trying to sort out some of these complex issues uh, that are brought up uh, so often today uh, and particularly uh, in some of these controversial areas like sexual ethics or medical ethics, but also in other branches uh, of ethics uh, that we'll be talking about as we go through the remainder of the course in the next one. So what I want to do here uh, is to just uh, introduce the principle of double effect to you, uh, talk a little bit about how it works, uh, and then we can, uh, again, continue the discussion of this on Blackboard and also uh, during the weekend we can talk about 
some of the questions that might uh, likely follow from this brief introduction to the idea of the principle of double effect. Okay, so let's say uh, we've got this complex situation. We need to apply the principle of double effect here. How are we going to do that? Okay, well, we have to go through uh, four steps, right? There are four criteria that make up the principle of double effect. Uh, and it's important to say from the outset, right, that if any one of the four uh, is violated, that means that the act is immoral, right? So this isn't a situation, well, we got, you know, three out of four or two out of four, so we're good to go. Uh, what this is is a checklist, and each of these criteria needs to be met in order for an action to be moral according to the principle of double effect. Okay, so the first step is to uh, look at the act uh, and ask, is the act itself immoral? Uh, if the act itself is immoral, it doesn't matter if uh, one or more of the consequences from it or one or more of the effects is going to be good, uh, you can't do the act. Now this is in some ways really just a restatement of the basic principle of natural law that you should uh, do and pursue good and avoid evil. Um, but it needs to be said, right? Because many times in society people bring up situations where, uh, well look, this is gonna get us this great thing. This is gonna save someone's life. This is gonna uh, bring about this great economic benefit. Um, so doesn't that mean we can do it? Well, the first step in natural law reasoning is to say, well, is the action itself that we're considering uh, moral or immoral? And if it's immoral, then no matter how good the consequences might be, how good the effects might be, uh, we can't uh, do it. So, for example, uh, in the case of uh, a mother's life being in danger during a pregnancy, uh, if a doctor says uh, the way we need to save this mother's life is by uh, directly aborting uh, the unborn child, uh, principle of double effect says we can't do that, right? Because uh, intentionally killing an innocent human person is always immoral. Uh, so regardless of the consequences, regardless of the effect, if the act itself being considered is the intentional killing of uh, an innocent human person, uh, we can't do it, right? And the reasoning will stop. Um, we'll stop there and there's really no reason to consider the rest of the criteria. All right, so let's uh, go on down the line. Let's say we're considering an action uh, where the act itself isn't necessarily immoral. Okay. Well, what's the next step? Well, the next step is to say uh, that our intention must be for the good, right? So if we're presented with an action or a choice that has a good effect and a bad effect, uh, this is basically a principle that says uh, you can't go into that uh, and carry out the action because what you really want is the immoral or bad effect, uh, and you're just using the fact that it also has this good effect as basically an excuse or a cover for doing the bad thing that you want to do. Uh, so what would this possibly look like? Uh, well, one example that often comes up uh, is uh, the example of, say, a woman uh, getting a hysterectomy, right? So there can be uh, medical conditions, serious medical conditions, uh, where a uh, hysterectomy is really the, the only or the most effective way of dealing with uh, a serious medical problem. Uh, that's causing a great deal of suffering uh, and difficulty for uh, a particular woman. Uh, so there's nothing intrinsically immoral about uh, removing uh, a diseased or injured bodily organ like a uterus. Um, that act in and of itself is not intrinsically wrong. So we pass the first step. All right, now what are the effects of this operation? Well, uh, let's say the effects of the operation is on the one hand, uh, we have the treatment of the medical condition, whatever that might be, uh, and that's going to be alleviated. So one effect is going to be the alleviation of pain and suffering uh, and possible long-term health uh, risks. On the other hand, there will be the loss of fertility, right? That after hysterectomy, obviously, a woman is going to be unable to uh, bear a child, right? So that is, from the perspective of natural law, uh, a loss of a good part of our nature, and therefore that's a bad effect. So we have a good effect, the treatment of the disease or the illness, uh, and we have a bad effect, the loss of fertility. Now, uh, if a woman were to go into this, uh, and what she really wants uh, is to uh, be rendered infertile, 
uh, she really, you know, she's let's say she's in a Catholic environment. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons, social pressures against her using uh, any sort of artificial contraception or natural family plan or whatever it might be. Uh, but she really wants to uh, not have any more children, to not be open uh, to the possibility of life, wants to be infertile. So she goes through with a hysterectomy not to deal with uh, the medical condition, but because what she really wants is uh, the sterilization. That would be an example of violating uh, the second criterion of the principle of double effect. All right, number three. Uh, let's move on down the line. And assume we have a case where uh, we pass numbers one and two. What is uh, criterion number three? Well, that one says we can't get the good effect through the bad effect. Right? This is kind of like pool. You know, you can't use the eight ball uh, to knock in any of the others. Actually, it's been probably 15 years since I played pool, but I think that was a rule at one point or another. Not particularly important here. Um, okay, back to natural law uh, and random tangent over. What does this mean, right? We can't give the good effect uh, through the bad. Well, an example that comes up uh, to deal with this particular criterion is uh, end-of-life care and, say, pain management, right? So let's uh, say we have a situation where uh, you have a patient who's in the very end of their life from some serious, obviously, uh, terminal medical condition, and they're in a great deal of pain and suffering. Uh, and this often raises some difficult ethical issues when people get to this stage uh, in their life. Excuse me. And so, obviously, what we want to do is to help this person uh, to alleviate their pain and suffering as much as possible. Now, uh, let's say look, this patient is in a lot of pain, is not really responding to the kind of ordinary pain control measures, um, we are presented with an option of giving this patient uh, a significantly larger do dose of pain medicine. Right now, uh, in some cases, this is going to mean, right, where we have, uh, for the increased pain uh, control, that there's an increased possibility that breathing or other vital functions are going to be suppressed and that could increase the chance of this person dying sooner uh, than they would otherwise. Uh, now using the principle of double effect um, you could have a situation like that where in fact all of the criteria would be met and it could be moral in fact to go ahead and give uh, a higher dose of pain medicine to address the pain even if it did mean there might be uh, a slightly earlier death or an increased risk of uh, an earlier death. Well, let's say we have a situation where uh, it really doesn't seem like any of our conventional pain uh, control methods are going to work uh, and the doctor advises well we're going to give this really large dose of, of painkiller. Uh, and in essence what this is going to do is going to uh, suppress the patient's breathing and heart rate uh, and actually bring about the patient's death uh, prematurely or earlier. Uh, and it's by this method that the pain is going to be uh, controlled, right? So we have so much pain medicine that really the way the pain control is going to happen is through speeding up the dying process. So that would be an example of violating this third principle, right? This is a situation where, uh, look, giving people uh, pain medicine isn't intrinsically wrong. Uh, the doctor isn't wanting or desiring the death of the patient. They are, in fact, desiring uh, the pain control. But if the way you're reaching that, the way you're attaining that pain control is through the bad effect, through causing uh, the earlier death, uh, then in fact you can't do that. That would be a violation of this third criterion of the principle of double effect. Okay, uh, finally, uh, number four, uh, the good outcome or the good effect must outweigh the bad, right? And so this is to say, even if all these other criteria are, are met, um, when we're faced with these kinds of choices, uh, you can't go ahead with the action if the bad effect is going to be substantially greater uh, than the good that's going to come from it. So to go back to, say, for example, uh, the hysterectomy uh, scenario, let's say a woman is suffering from uh, a relatively mild uh, disorder that's causing some discomfort, but uh, it could probably be dealt with uh, in other ways. Um, although the doctor offers the option, well, one way we could treat this would be uh, by a hysterectomy. Uh, 
Uh, now, if that were the sort of situation where you have a significant bad effect from the perspective of natural law, namely the loss of fertility, um, to uh, bring about uh, a relatively small, relatively modest uh, good effect, the alleviation of moderate or, or mild discomfort or pain, uh, that would not meet this final criterion of principle of double effect. Uh, now, if it were a serious ailment that caused significant uh, difficulty, significant suffering or pain, uh, that would change things. Um, but you can't do something that brings about a significant bad or evil effect uh, if uh, the good to be had from it is, is small or pretty moderate. Um, so that is, uh, in a relatively brief nutshell, uh, a walk through the principle of double effect. Uh, and one last thing to emphasize here before we wrap this up, and certainly uh, I would be happy to discuss this further on Blackboard or on the weekend, uh, it's important to emphasize when you present this um, that this is not the same as consequentialism. This is not utilitarianism. This is not saying that the ends justify the means or that whatever is going to produce the most happiness is the right thing to do. All right, from all of these steps, uh, make it clear, especially step one, two, and three, um, that it's just not the goodness of the overall effects that determines whether something's right or wrong. Uh, your intentions, the nature of the act, um, what you directly do, uh, all of these things matter in terms of deciding whether an action is moral or not. It's only when you meet all those other criteria that you look at weighing uh, the good and bad effects in that final step of the reasoning process. So this is not in any way saying consequentialism is okay or utilitarianism is okay. All right, so we will leave that for now and turn on to the next page to look at uh, another helpful principle, uh, the principle of legitimate cooperation. It would be nice if all of the moral choices uh, and dilemmas that we were faced with in life were nice and straightforward. Should I knock the old lady over in the crosswalk because I'm in a hurry to get to my haircut appointment? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, we've wrapped that up. Now we can move on to the next topic. Um, but unfortunately, of course, of course uh, most of uh, life is a little more complicated than that. And certainly the dilemmas that are brought up uh, when we discuss medical ethics or sexual ethics or economic ethics are often much more complicated than that. Uh, now the principle of double effect is very useful in dealing uh, with a great number of those uh, complicated situations. But there are other kinds of complicated moral situations as well uh, which come up uh, very often in our modern lifestyles. Right? There are a lot of situations where uh, it's not me directly doing something uh, and trying to determine whether or not uh, this action is right or wrong. There are lots of things that we do lots of actions that we share in or participate in where we are only one uh, small part, one small participant in a much larger uh, system, uh, right? So uh, we make many sorts of actions uh, as consumers or as citizens or as students or as um, employees, right? And there, there are all these actions that we carry out uh, in this big, complicated, interconnected modern world of ours where uh, my particular moral action uh, really only makes sense as part of this much larger system. Uh, and there are a lot of situations where uh, we can see that something is going wrong in this larger system, right? That the system is doing something that is wrong. Uh, and this raises then the question of, okay, well look, there's this wrong thing going on that's being done by this government or by this company uh, or by this community or institution. And I am connected with that. I am a citizen, I'm an employee, I'm a consumer. What does this mean for me, right? What is my moral responsibility? Uh, and how do I decide uh, what I need to do, what my obligations are in this situation? Given that it's not as simple as me doing this bad thing. It's me being part of this much larger system that is over here doing this bad thing. How do we work through these sorts of uh, dilemmas? And these come up constantly. Uh, if you're like me, uh, I'm not on Facebook, so I'm spared some of this. But even on email, uh, it's pretty frequently that you will get uh, someone 
forwarding you some mass email calling for a boycott uh, of some company or another because they're doing X, Y, or Z. Uh, and that would be an example of this, right? Uh, as a consumer, uh, am I supporting this company by buying their products? It seems so. Uh, so what does it mean if that company is doing something bad? How do I think through uh, how to act as a consumer, an employee, a citizen, so on and so forth? Um, and this is where the principle of legitimate cooperation uh, gives us, like the principle of double effect, uh, a framework for working through these sorts of situations. Right? So this is again sort of an extension of natural law, um, but specifically tuned to deal with these sorts of situations where we're part of larger systems uh, and trying to work out what our responsibility is uh, in those sorts of cases. Uh, and again, like the principle of double effect, uh, unfortunately this is not kind of a magic equation where we can just plug in the data and outcomes uh, outcomes the decision for us. Uh, this is giving us again a framework uh, and it's still going to take uh, a lot of prudence and careful thinking to figure out how the framework applies to a particular um, situation. But what it does at least is it gives us a framework, it gives us a starting point because so often when we're faced with complex moral situations, a lot of people just throw up their hands and say, well, this is too big, this is too complicated, I can't figure out what I'm supposed to do as just one citizen of hundreds of millions or, or one consumer out of, again, millions and millions. So I, I'm just not going to, I just got to go with the flow. Um, this gives us at least a way of uh, trying to work through these sorts of situations. Okay, so what does the principle of legitimate cooperation uh, do? How does it work? Uh, well, what the principle of legitimate cooperation does is it gives us um, a sort of breakdown of the different degrees of cooperation that a person can have uh, in a moral action or in really in these cases immoral actions. This is really a, a framework for we recognize something immoral is going on so now we need to figure out what's my degree of cooperation with this given my particular role. Uh, and what does that mean in terms of my responsibility? Uh, so there can be, as the name implies, uh, there could be legitimate cooperation, right? Even with uh, systems that are doing something immoral. Um, but also obviously there's going to be situations where our cooperation is going to be immoral. So that's what this, this principle, uh, this framework is going to do. Uh, okay, so how does this work? Well, let's take the example of a hospital where abortions are being performed. Um, what are the different levels of cooperation that a person can have with that and what are the consequences that follow from that? Well the highest level of cooperation a person can have is formal cooperation. Right? This is when uh, a person uh, agrees with uh, the immoral act being carried out. So if uh, you uh, were applying for jobs and specifically sought this hospital out because you are a big supporter of abortion uh, and you wanted to uh, come to work at this hospital because it was the hospital that provided abortions in the area, that would be formal cooperation. Or you are formally agreeing with uh, this immoral action that's being committed uh, and obviously then you are morally responsible uh, for your cooperation and you are acting immorally. Uh, in that situation. Okay, so that one is pretty straightforward and, and easy. Um, now let's move down to the next step. Let's say that you don't uh, personally agree with the morality of abortion. You think abortion is in fact uh, immoral. Uh, what does this mean about your moral responsibility? Well, again, it's going to vary depending on how, uh, how closely you are cooperating with or participating with the immoral act that's being performed. Um, so this kind of cooperation where you don't agree in principle with what's being done but are somehow involved is called material cooperation. right? So you aren't formally assenting to it but you are still materially, physically, institutionally involved in it. Um, so the closest level or the, the highest level of material cooperation would be immediate material cooperation. So let's say you are a surgical nurse um, and you take this job at this hospital and you're personally opposed to abortion, you think it's immoral, but you take this job and they say, well look, uh, we're going to need you up in uh, the procedure room today 
to hand instruments to the doctor who's performing the abortion. That would be immediate material cooperation. You are immediately uh, materially involved in the performance of this immoral act. Uh, and the principle of legitimate cooperation says immediate material cooperation is immoral. Right? So even though you don't agree with what's going on, you are close enough to it, you are involved enough that you are acting immorally uh, by uh, consenting to be in that situation and by participating in that situation in that immediate way. So that would be immoral. And you would therefore have a moral obligation to say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that, even if it meant you were going to lose your job. Um, okay, let's say you're not quite that closely involved. You're not handing the instruments to the doctor. Um, what would be a, a lower level of cooperation? Well, this would be, uh, takes us to the next level, which is mediated material cooperation. Uh, and this has two different levels. Uh, there is proximate material cooperation. Well, what does that mean? Well, an example could be um, you are not the nurse handing the, the scalpel to the doctor, uh, but let's say you are a technician whose job it is uh, to set up the room for procedures. Uh, right Now, if your job is to set up the room for uh, abortions to be performed, uh, that could be an example of uh, uh, proximate material cooperation. You're, right, you're not right there, you're not right in the nitty-gritty, so to speak, uh, but you are uh, somewhat closely involved in the situation. And again, this is just a general category for helping people think through this. Um, there's no formula for figuring out what's proximate, what's immediate, uh, and what's remote, which we'll get to in a minute. But this is, a, a again, a general guideline. So if you are proximately involved, uh, like um, setting up the room, or if you worked in the accounting department and your specific job was uh, to work to get insurance uh, payments specifically to cover uh, abortions performed in the hospital, that could be another form of proximate uh, material cooperation. Principle of legitimate cooperation would say that that too is immoral, right? that you can't be uh, even proximately involved in an immoral action uh, you have a moral obligation to remove yourself from that degree, degree of cooperation. Again, even if it would mean, for example, losing your job. All right, so we've obviously got one step left. Uh, and if you're thinking about it, uh, for this rule to be very useful, uh, there needs to probably be something slightly different here, and that is, in fact, the case. All right, so when we get to the next step removed from the action, which is called remote material cooperation, this is going to say, uh, yes, you do have some connections with the institution or system, but your degree of material involvement in the particular immoral thing being done is remote. So let's say you are a janitor, right, and you're applying for jobs all over town, uh, and the only place you can get a job is at this hospital, uh, which is performing abortions. You're opposed to abortions yourself. Uh, you really wish even that you could be at a hospital that didn't do this, but as it stands now, this is the only job you can get, and this is the only way that you can provide for yourself and for your family. And this would be an example of remote material cooperation. Yes, there's something bad being done. Yes, you are connected with the institution or the system, but only remotely are you uh, connected to the immoral act. Uh, in principle, legitimate cooperation would say that in that situation, it can be moral to continue that remote material cooperation. Uh, so, for again, for example, uh, it seems very likely that our tax dollars are used for immoral things. Uh, but if you are one of uh, tens of millions of taxpayers and you have no direct uh, involvement with the immoral things being done, you don't agree with them, that would probably be another example of remote material cooperation. Now, if our taxes were set up in such a way that uh, they said, you need to give X amount of money to do this immoral thing, specifically on your tax form, that would really change the picture and would probably move you higher up and you would then have a moral obligation to refuse to pay that tax. Uh, but, well, uh, that would be an issue for another day. But back to our example of the janitor, he could morally keep that job. Now, the conversation doesn't end there, however. Even if you are only remotely materially involved, uh, Principle of legitimate cooperation is going to say that you ought to work 
to remove yourself from that cooperation if possible. Um, so if the janitor finds out that there's another job available that can provide for him and his family, uh, where he will be at a hospital that isn't uh, performing abortions, uh, he ought to pursue that. Or if you can choose between uh, two brands of sneakers, right, and uh, you need sneakers for your particular job, let's assume, um, and, you know, if both uh, of your available options, these are the only two options you have, both of them are abusing child laborers overseas, um, it could be moral perhaps to buy these shoes if you absolutely have to have them and there are no other options available and you're not there, you know, cracking the whip. However, uh, if there were another option uh, that wasn't uh, abusing child labor, uh, then you would have a moral obligation to choose that uh, other option where you aren't remotely participating in this immoral action. Um, now, uh, if you're thinking through this, uh, this raises all kinds of complicated issues, right? Uh, and in many cases, there are going to be limits to uh, the amount of time and effort that we can spend in trying to find uh, morally ideal companies to do business with, right? So there are obviously going to be limits in terms of our time and energy to carry this out in every possible decision we make. Uh, but this principle is meant to help guide us in those decisions where it really comes to our attention. Look, there's this immoral thing going on. I'm involved in this system somehow. Can I continue to do that or do I need to make some sort of drastic change or should I just look for a possible long-term option to get out of this involvement? So that's what the principle of legitimate cooperation uh, seeks to do. And so hopefully that uh, makes a little sense. And again, we can ask questions about that certainly. Uh, and we will come back to the principle as we go through the course and look at specific issues uh, in the remainder of this class and in the next one. All right, there's one last thing I wanted to end our discussion of uh, kind of random topics in natural law uh, in this module on, and that's the issue of moral absolutes. Um, and again, this isn't something addressed uh, in any real length uh, in the textbook, but it does come up uh, in discussions of natural law today quite a bit, so I think it's important for you to have an understanding of what this is referring to. Uh, and it will come up again uh, in the next module or two where we're going to look at uh, some controversies regarding whether or not there are moral absolutes. Uh, but we'll save that debate for another day. For the moment, I just want to uh, explain what this idea means. Right? And so the um, moral absolutes are, are particular types of moral norms. Right, so if you remember back a module or two, uh, moral norms are kind of the specific uh, moral rules, moral guides that we use to make kind of our day-to-day -day decisions. Thou shalt not steal is a moral norm. Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery is a moral norm. Um, you know, all those kinds of handy rules uh, that help make our day-to-day -day decisions easier are moral norms. Right, and so within this broad field of moral norms, uh, the idea of moral absolutes says uh, that some of these moral norms are in fact uh, absolute, right? So that you can never in fact have a situation uh, where it would be permissible or moral to do this thing, right? Well, what does that mean? Is, aren't they all that way? Well, again, to go back to some of our examples earlier, uh, there's the, the moral norm of thou shalt not steal. Right? But we talked about how uh, there can be situations where um, uh, it seems like at least the, the basic understanding of that uh, doesn't really apply. Uh, where in fact um, there can be situations where you can uh, take someone's property or property that's in someone's possession against their will. Um, now that's not necessarily stealing, the real argument is in this case um, in fact, uh, what we are doing is taking something they don't have a right to. Um, so part of it is working out, well, what does the moral norm really mean? Uh, but if we even have the more basic moral norm of uh, don't take uh, objects in someone's possession against their will. Let's say that was our moral norm. It's a little clunky, but uh, in general, that would be a good moral norm. You shouldn't take um, something that is another person's possession against their will. However, that is not 
uh, a moral norm that's without exception. There can be cases where you can, in fact, morally take something that is in someone else's possession against their will. If, for example, uh, it's a situation where they don't really have a right to that possession. Um, so that would be an example of a moral norm that does, in fact, have an exception to it. Uh, it would be a handy moral norm to generally say you shouldn't cut off uh, people's arms. Probably a reasonable moral norm, although not a popular one because it, I don't think it comes up all that often. Um, but that wouldn't be an example of a moral absolute, right? Because there can, in fact, be situations where uh, you can or even ought to cut off a person's arm, right? So if you are a doctor uh, and an arm is diseased and infected and is going to um, endanger a patient's life, you can, in fact, and maybe even have a moral obligation to cut off the patient's arm. Uh, or, you know, if you're out hiking and the, uh, there's a landslide and your buddy's arm gets stuck under a boulder and the river is rising, uh, and the only way that you're going to be able to save that person's life is uh, one of those, you know, true life gruesome adventure stories where uh, you have to cut off his arm to save him. Well, again, it would be very unpleasant, but it wouldn't be immoral uh, in that sort of extreme situation. So the moral norm, don't cut off people's arms, is not, in fact, uh, a moral absolute. However, obviously, given the fact that we're discussing this, there are moral norms uh, which traditional natural law theory would say are, in fact, absolute. So, for example, uh, never intentionally kill an innocent human person. Uh, that is, in fact, uh, a moral absolute. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter how extreme the stakes might be. Uh, you can never morally intentionally kill an innocent human person. Uh, that is a moral absolute. Uh, another moral absolute that just came up uh, a moment ago was thou shalt not commit adultery. Right? There is no situation uh, where you can uh, intentionally commit adultery uh, and have it be moral. It doesn't matter what the stakes are. Uh, adultery is always uh, immoral. All right, so those are two kind of uh, perhaps the most obvious examples. Uh, never intentionally kill an innocent human person could be shortened to thou shalt not commit murder. Uh, so don't commit murder, don't commit adultery are probably the two most straightforward moral absolutes. Um, now there might be some people who would debate uh, the adultery one as we've seen uh, evidence from uh, websites. Uh, not too many people make arguments for murder, uh, but there are moral absolutes where people do uh, debate. Uh, and so one of these is, uh, that comes up quite often in, in recent Catholic ethical debates, is the issue of contraception. Uh, so many natural law theorists argue that uh, you should not uh, contracept, you should not intentionally use artificial contraception, uh, is a moral absolute. Uh, on the other hand, there are many people who argue that um, there could be situations where uh, it would be permissible, much like the cutting off the arm example. Uh, now, the particular debate and all of the issues raised by contraception is something we will get to shortly in a couple of modules here, so we'll save those arguments for the time being. But I thought it was important here uh, in this module to at least introduce this idea of moral absolutes, uh, because we will be getting to specific issues later on, like the issue of contraception, uh, and also because uh, in the next couple of modules, we'll be looking at uh, some of the debates around contemporary natural law and some of the modern criticisms and even modern Catholic criticisms, which include um, a movement known as proportionalism, which argues that uh, they would say they agree with many of the ideas in natural law, uh, but they disagree with the idea that there are, in fact, moral absolutes. Uh, so it's important to introduce what moral absolutes are before we get to the critics who would not deny their existence. Uh, so, though, we will end uh, the module here for the moment, and we'll get to that uh, another day. As always, if you have any questions about any of this, feel free to uh, ask in the discussion board, and particularly in uh, Ask the Professor, uh, and I will look for your comments and questions there.